This is Juan Manuel Fangio, a living legend. It was once said of him that if fame is money, he is the richest man in Argentina. Every weekend, Juan Fangio drives the more than 250 miles from his office in Buenos Aires to his hometown of Balcarce. Today, he drives leisurely, enjoying the magnificent Argentine countryside. More than two decades ago, Juan Manuel Fangio drove the famed race courses of the world and established himself as the greatest race driver in history. He was born here in the year 1911. Juan Fangio gained worldwide fame on the great auto racing courses of the world. Monte Carlo, Monza, Rheem, the Nürburgring. But after the racing season was over, he always returned to Balcarce. Mostly here in Balcarce, we are children of Italian parents who came here at the turn of the century. We were all born here in this house which my father built, all my brothers and sisters. I live here rather than other places because these are my roots and this is the land I love. My parents taught us that the family must always stay together. I remember my brothers, sisters, cousins, nephews, grandchildren would gather every Sunday and we would talk and laugh. And now that I'm sort of head of the family, I want to preserve this custom every Sunday, just as when my father and mother were alive. Today, everything is the same. The whole family gathers together, and like before, we talk and laugh. Incredibly, Fangio's greatest moments in racing took place after he was 40 years old, long after most drivers had left the circuit. He was world champion five times between his 40th and 47th birthday. One of the few drivers in racing history to be compared with Juan Fangio is Sterling Moss of Great Britain. Fangio, to me, uh, was the best driver in the world, bar none. Uh, in my mind, he was the best driver we've ever known. He was a great man. I can't really remember having Fangio having a, an off day. And Fangio's rhythm was, was fantastic. He, he was a man that whatever he could do once, he could continue to do. And, and it was a, a beautiful balance in the rhythm of a man and the vehicle. I could never think of the machine as an inanimate object to be thrashed at will. I felt that the car entrusted to me was a living thing. As a result, when anything broke, I felt as if I myself had been wounded. Juan Fangio was a product of the primitive barnstorming days of auto racing. In the year 1922, when he was 11, his future was already determined. When I was a kid, I used to dream about being a race driver. After school, I would work at the garage just to be near motors. No one taught me how to drive. I just drove. I never told my father about my driving aspirations. Today, I still work on my cars just as I did in my youth. Every little town, even Balcarce, had a track. They were primitive, nothing like today. All the kids would build cars with anything available. In those days, the parts were interchangeable. An engine from a Model T Ford, the rear end of a Chevrolet, anything from a Buick. After a race, there was usually so much damage, it had to be rebuilt for the next race. Juan Fangio upset all the popular conceptions that through the decades have been associated with great auto racing drivers. To the public, the champion race driver is tall, young, graceful, adventurous, flamboyant and vain. Juan Fangio was stocky, balding, quiet, subdued, and avoided the limelight. Yet when he raced on the Grand Prix circuit, fellow drivers were awed by his presence. Phil Hill, one of two American drivers to have won the Grand Prix World Championship, raced against Fangio during the 1950s. About a dozen of us Americans went down to Buenos Aires in 1954 to take part in the Temperata which is a, several weeks of racing down there. And, uh, and I remember that moment very clearly. There was a certain presence about the man that no other racing driver that I'd ever known has had. I've tried to, in 
subsequent years say that, oh, it's part of his cultural manner that made him appear that way and that I was reading it into it and everything. But I've seen him again and again as the years have gone by, and I'm still convinced that there is something very special about him. In his early racing days, Fangio was the second man in the car, a mechanic acting as ballast, leaning outside the car on turns to keep it from tipping over. But it was these races in which the men drove and fixed their own cars that set the stage for Fangio's future greatness. People would say that, you know, well, of course, Fangio won because he's driving the best cars. It is true, he did drive the best cars, but he drove the best cars because he was the best driver. I think that the reason that Fangio had less mechanical problems with, than other people were, were two or threefold. One is because he had very good cars because he was a very good driver. Two is I think his demands upon the car were probably less than others to get the performance that other people got. I mean, it's very similar in ordinary life. You can get people to do things by asking them, and uh, you can get people by telling them. Fangio would ask. And I think, you know, it's like leading a horse to water and you can't make it drink. Well, I think Fangio could make it drink because of the way he put the things over. It is 1939. Juan Manuel Fangio is 28 years old. He decides to enter the Grand Prix of Argentina. A 3,750-mile race through tortuous terrain. There were no repair shops. Fangio and his mechanic sitting beside him had to make their own repairs along the way. Muy antiguo, quizás. This was my first big race. My car was built by contributions from all my friends in Balcarce. I still have a list of people. Some of them contributed only 50 or 60 centavos. Hundreds of people donated. Fangio was in the lead during the early part of the race. But then he hit a curb and damaged the car. Nevertheless, he finished fifth out of 120 starters. After the race, we had to rebuild the car and sell it to pay off all our debts. I was nearing 30 and had not yet won my first victory. The following year, Fangio entered the Gran Premio Internacional del Norte, a 6,000-mile race. With Balcarce imprinted on his car, he began the mountainous 3,000-mile course to Lima, Peru, then back again to the start in Buenos Aires. The race was a terrible ordeal. We had to improvise the whole way. Early in the race, we hit a big stone and the drive shaft became locked. We were able to unlock it, but at the next town, it would have to be replaced. There was always a little celebration at an overnight stop. Once, one of the townspeople crashed into our car and bent an axle. It had to be repaired. When we started off again, a fan blade got loose and punctured the radiator. We traveled 150 miles through desert. There was no water. Fortunately, we came across an abandoned water tank. Later, we smashed our windshield and our headlights. We had no rope, so we secured the headlights with my co-pilot's necktie. In the mountains, I would drive with my co-pilot's arms around me to keep warm. It sounds incredible, but we won the race. My first victory. It was a proud moment when we crossed the finish line with the name Balcarce inscribed on the top of the car. The race was exhausting. In the beginning, I would have been happy to have finished. Now I had won my first victory. I don't think Fangio was necessarily more fit than another driver. I never saw him doing physical push-ups or anything like that. I mean, he was, he was a strong man, a very compact and tough guy. I don't mean physically to hit people hard, I don't know. But, it, but the tenacity that he had and his ability to be able to take the machine and, and extract from it the very ultimate. And, and I think that if you add all those things together, you then get to what is the greatest racing driver and the most perfect racing machine in the world. In 1948, with World War II over for three years and the Grand Prix racing circuit again underway, two important events took place in Argentina. Juan Perón had taken over as president and he was determined to make Buenos Aires a motor racing capital. The great racing drivers of Europe were invited to compete in Argentina. 36-year-old Juan Fangio was selected to be one of the drivers who would represent Argentina on the Grand Prix circuit. But before he would race in Europe, he would enter the 1948 Buenos Aires to Caracas road race. It was one of the worst tragedies of my life. One night I was very tired and the fog was very thick. I was in the lead. On a curve, my car went off the road and turned over many times. My dear friend and co-pilot was killed. At that time, I did not believe I would ever race again. 
I don't know how Fangio dealt with the with the life and death aspect of racing. I know I never got into a deep conversation with Juan about death and life. It isn't the sort of thing that drivers would speak about, even if we had a common language, which we didn't. I think that Fangio appreciated the dangers and felt probably the same way as I did. In other words, I've got to be good enough. It's not going to happen to me. 1949 was the first year Fangio raced against the great European drivers. In ten events, he was first to cross the finish line six times. He brought a new form of driving to the international sea, the perfect blending of human and machine. At the end of his first season, it was written, at the wheel of a racing car, he is an artist. His fine mechanic's ear is attuned to the engine's telltale throb. He rarely strains his car, rarely pushes it past the limits of mechanical endurance. Fangio belongs to a school that believes that any spectacular burst of speed is useless unless the driver finishes the race. A race is not won at the start. The most important thing is to know the qualities of your car as compared to your opponents. There's no need to leave the others behind at the start. You must preserve your car for the end. A car has a life of its own. I have talked to my car while racing many times. I felt it was part of me. Yes, I have even kissed my car at the end of the race. The year after his first Grand Prix championship, Fangio was in the most serious accident of his career. Fortunately, in the year 1952, the year of my most serious accident, it became compulsory to wear a wooden helmet. Up to that time, we used to wear cloth helmets like this. My uniform was a cloth helmet, goggles, short-sleeved shirt, and pants. This helmet saved me. It is all dented and worn from my being thrown on the ground. I was hospitalized for a long time with a broken vertebrae, but there was never a moment I did not think I would race again. All of us who race realize the dangers we share. That is why we learn to trust each other. One cannot compete well if he thinks about the possibilities of his own death. In 1951, 40-year-old Juan Fangio won his first world championship. His victory confirmed the accolades that already had been bestowed upon him by the other drivers on the circuit. Fangio could do no wrong. One driver, when asked to compare the elite drivers of the world, said, There is the old man, and then there are the rest of us. After his third world championship in 1955, a fellow driver said, He is like a god. Do you know anyone who is jealous of God? Said one Grand Prix driver, the ratio of driver to car is normally 25% driver, 75% car. With the old man, it is 40% driver, 60% car. So you see, before the start of a race, he had us by 15%. I never felt up to Fangio's quality uh, during the years that I was there. Well, I never did, really, to tell you the truth. I always felt that he was uh, uh, just above uh, about everyone. He was always unthreatened by new guys or by anybody, for that matter. He had an aura and, very probably, a belief in himself that uh, enabled him to function in a very human and civil sort of way. And that's not the case with most racing drivers. They don't help one another. And Fangio never uh, was that way. I was, I, I was always very proud to be uh, competing in the, in the same race. The British Grand Prix in 1955 was a race where I had managed to beat Fangio by half a car's length. I don't know. Now, I don't know if I beat him or whether he sort of thought, well, it's England home, let's serving win. I don't know. And that's the sort of man he is. I can't find out. I know you'd tell me. If, he, if I asked him, he'd say, no, of course you won. I mean, I know that. But that, doesn't, that isn't the answer to the thing, is he? He's, he's a very human man, a very kind man, a very gentle and honest person. And above all that, or with all that, he is the greatest driver I think the world's ever known. Fangio's career record confirms his reputation as a genius behind the wheel. They called him the Picasso of the circuit, the maestro, or simply the old man. I've seen his driving skill on many occasions, and it didn't matter what the conditions were like, it didn't matter where, where we were, it, it, there was... If problems arose, like the Le Mans accident, which was a dreadful problem, he had the right... He just had the thing all together to get through there. June 11, 1955. The Le Mans 24-hour Grand Prix. Fangio and Mike Hawthorne of Great Britain are leading the field by one lap. It is 6.10 p.m. 
It all happened so fast. My teammate Pierre Levé was driving very fast as Mike Hawthorne slowed down for a pit stop. The young British driver, Lance Macklin, swerved slightly to avoid Hawthorne. I was 100 meters back and saw everything. Levé, who by that time was quite old for racing, ran right up Macklin's back. Levé's car exploded. The engine of his car slashed through the crowd in the stands. 81 people were killed. Pierre Levé was killed instantly. Incredibly, I passed through the whole nightmare and was untouched. Afterwards, Mike Hawthorne came to me in tears, saying it was his fault. I told him I was an observer to the whole thing and that he was not at fault. But these things happen. It is August 4th, 1957. The German Grand Prix at Nürburgring. 46-year-old Juan Fangio needs a victory here to clinch his fifth world championship. He is driving a Maserati. His main opposition, the Ferrari team led by Mike Hawthorne and Peter Collins of Great Britain. The Nürburgring, a race nearly 450 miles long. The course, 14 miles of almost 200 twisting curves and winding roads that are hemmed in by trees, rocks, and ravines. I knew Hawthorne's and Collins' Ferraris were faster than my Maserati. Added to this was the fact that my car had a weak rear suspension and it would have been dangerous to carry the full load of fuel needed to go the entire distance without a stop. I knew that Hawthorne and Collins would be able to go the entire distance without refueling. Therefore, I had to build up a large lead over the Ferraris. With luck, I would still have a lead after refueling. My plan worked perfectly. When I came into refuel, I had almost a 30-second lead over the Ferraris. My crew worked very hard, but fate was against us. It was decided to change tires, and this took more time than usual. I saw Collins and Hawthorne go by. When I left the pit, they had built up a lead of almost 30 seconds, the same advantage I had had over them before I came into refuel. Fangio starts out after the Ferraris. With each lap, Fangio in third place slowly closes the distance between him and the two British drivers. On the 17th time around, he breaks the lap record. The race goes on, and each time around, he breaks the lap record he has just set. Finally, he is right behind Collins and Hawthorne. My most satisfying victory. I was 46 years old and had defeated younger drivers in cars superior to mine. It was my fifth world championship. I knew my career was coming to a close. The one who had tasted success so many times, it would indeed be galling to finish behind a comparatively unknown driver merely because he had the advantage of youth. But it was a non-racing situation that convinced me not to tempt fortune anymore. In 1958, I was in Cuba for another Grand Prix. The night before the race, followers of Fidel Castro kidnapped me and held me hostage. There was no danger for me, but after I was released, I learned that during the sixth lap of the race, there was an accident. A car crashed, killing several spectators. Two things resulted from this incident. One, I received worldwide fame more than I received during my years on the track. Two, because of a terrible accident, I still wonder whether the kidnappers had not done me a big favor by preventing me from entering the race. It is more than two decades since Juan Fangio drove the Grand Prix circuits of the world. 
Today is president of Mercedes-Benz Argentina. He has fame, wealth, even more, he has endured. What is the reward for all this effort? Money? No. Fame? No. My reward is my memories. The constant striving for victory. I have pursued and realized the greatest ambition of my life. At first, a world title had been the limit of my hopes and boldest dreams. Then I had to win a second one, then a third, then a fourth was added, and finally a fifth. And this one confirms that the others, perhaps, have not been due entirely to luck. So today, Juan Fangio returns to the place where he was born, Valcarce. For it is here he continues the tradition that he loved in his youth, the gathering of the family. His fame and wealth have not changed him. For Juan Manuel Fangio says, he who thinks he is a giant, when he stands beside the Andes, he is but a dwarf. France to drive in the Le Mans 24-hour Grand Prix of Endurance. The 